National Resource Center for understanding and clarification on Islam and comparative religion. Islamic Research Foundation provides for free hire and sale video and audio cassettes on Islam and comparative religion. This being the largest and best collection internationally. It includes films, television programs, documentaries, Quranic and Islamic studies programs as well as interviews, lectures, symposia, debates, etc. of world-renowned speakers like Sheikh Ahmad Didad, South Africa, Dr. Zakir Nair, India, Dr. Jamal Badawi, Canada, Dr. Khalid Al-Mansur, USA, Prophet Yusuf Islam, UK, Brother Gary Miller, Canada, Dr. Isra Ahmad, Pakistan, India and many others. Islamic Research Foundation also provides on request free literature on Islam and comparative religion. Please phone, call or write to Islamic Research Foundation 5658 Tandil Street North, Dongri, Mumbai 400009. تعاملون فائدتها اين ما كنتم فيما بعد ولكم من الله الاجر والثواب. 
هذه المحاضره سوف تلقى عليكم بلغه الانجليزيه وسيترجمها ما بعد الى اللغه العربيه للدكتور عبد الحميد. مثلكم جميعا احيي السيد المحاضر الدكتور المترجم واترككم معه في هذه المحاضره فليتفضل. unlearned prophet. We, we are a people of learning. We have the Torah, we have the Zabur, we have the Injil. Before the Holy Quran, the Arabs had no revelation to their credit. They couldn't name a prophet to their credit. So, the boast is that we are a learned people as against you barbarians. So, Allah Barithala flattered them. He honors them. He calls them again and again, Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book. Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book. O learned people. They love to be addressed that way. And Allah addresses them that way. The master psychologist. See how he is trying to win the hearts of people. He is teaching you how to do the job. In the essential of the teaching, of the people of the book and ourselves, there is no difference. In the essentials of the teaching, the fundamentals as given by Hazrat Musa a.s., Hazrat Isa a.s., and the Holy Prophet of Islam, no difference. There is not an iota of difference, one jot, one tittle, not the nukta difference between the teachings of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. May the peace of Allah be upon them all. This is not just a tall claim. It can be proven. See the first commandment or the shahada of the Jews as Allah gave to Hazrat Muhammad. The shahada, the awwal kalima, the first kalima. In the Hebrew language, it was Shama Israelu Adonai Lahainu Adonai Echad, which means Hero Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord is one. This was the teaching Allah gave to Hazrat Musa to the Bani Israel. He is the one and only God. Some 1300 years after Hazrat Musa a learned man of the Jew, described as a scribe in the learned man, in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, he comes to Jesus and questions him. The master in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, Sheikh Maulana. Master, what commandment is the first of all? 
what is the awwal kalima, the shahada? And Jesus answers and says unto them, and to him, so the first A in the Hebrew language, Shama Israel Adonai Rahainu Adonai Echa. It means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He repeated word for word what was given by Hazrat Musa alayhi salam 1300 years before, without the change of a dot. Some 600 years later, a Christian deputation comes to Medina from Najran and they had a dialogue with our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa in the Masjid al Nabawi for three days and perhaps three nights. During the course of the discussion, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question. He said, all right, all right, now tell us, O oh Muhammad, what is your concept of God? And our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa is made to say, Qul huwallahu ahad. Say, he is Allah the one and only. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, he said, ikhad. Isa alayhi salam, he said, ikhad. Our Nabi said, ahad. What's the difference? What is the difference? Actually, it's the same word meaning the same thing. If I write Ahad in Arabic, it's the Alif Ha Da Ahad. To make it Ikhad, on the Ha you put a dot. To make it Ha. The difference is the difference of a dot. This is only to produce a sound. Ha to Ha. In the meaning, no difference. Between Ahad and Ikhad. It means one and the same thing, the one and only. So in the fundamentals of the teachings of the prophets of God, no difference. But the teachings were given, each according to the need. Each according to the need. The Bani Israel had just come out of the Egyptian bondage. They were moving into the Sinai Peninsula from oasis to oasis. A nomadic people, for a people like that, they needed a law that would give them quick justice. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. There was no time for lengthy litigation. There was no time for putting a man in prison. It was more merciful to kill the adulterer by stoning him than to leave him in the desert to die of hunger and thirst. And he also becomes an object lesson for others. So do you see? You do that, see what happens? What happened to him is going to happen to you. An object lesson. Beautiful teaching. Beautiful teaching. In the desert. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You are injured my eye, I injure yours. I broke, you broke my tooth, I break yours. Move on. There's work to be done. Beautiful law. A Jesus or a Muhammad, peace be upon them both, could not have done anything better in the wilderness. Instead of Hazrat Musa, it was Hazrat Isa. Could he give a better law? No. Instead of Hazrat Musa, it was Muhammad. Could he have given a better law? No. This is coming from Allah according to the means. Each dispensation according to the need Allah gave guidance. So in the essentials of religion, the teachings of Hazrat Musa salam, Hazrat Isa salam, and the Prophet of Islam, no difference. The differences are created by man. We need milking cows for ourselves, exploitation. And the church is good business. In my country, we have a thousand different sects and denominations among the whites of South Africa, the European, and three thousand among the blacks. Black means African, is black, Indian is black, and a colored mixture between white and black is also black. Black, black, black. Among the blacks, three thousand different sects and denominations. And each and every one is looking for converts, business. So they have their own speciality. One says he's a Jehovah's Witness, the other says he's a Seventh-day Adventist, the other guy says I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Roman Catholic, and on and on and on. Three thousand among the blacks and a thousand among the whites. Good business. So now, in the essentials now, where did the difference start? In the beginning, at the very beginning, there was a question of jealousy. The Jews, who were surrounding Medina, they were around Medina, the Christians were very few. There was extreme jealousy, more especially the Jew as against the Arabs. The Jews were looking down upon the Arabs, their cousins. 
they insinuated that these Arabs are the children of Hagar, Bibi Hajra, they call her Hagar. And the children of Hagar are the Hagarim, Hagarim, these are the Christian missionaries, they are calling us today, Hagarim, the children of Hajra. And Islam is Hagarism, I've got a book here, by Christian missionaries. They call Islam Hagarism and the Muslims are Hagarim, children of Hajra. The challenge of Islam in South Africa. So it started this jealousy from the very first. But coming closer to our own period of time, you know, the competition has been greater. When the Christians started conquering our land, when we conquered Christian land, we didn't force being, we didn't even propagate. The proof of that is. After 800 years of rule in Spain, the Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years, they were kicked out to a man. Not one guy was left in that country to give the azan. Had they done anything at all, any kind of force, any kind of propagation, surely the situation would not have been that. After 800 years, not one person left in that country to give the azan. That's how successful we were in propagation, because we didn't do the job. Recently, more recently, see, I have stumbled across all this, more by accident. I didn't have any aspiration. I didn't want to study comparative religion. No, nothing. I left school. Having done my primary education, I left school to work in a country shop some 30 miles outside Durban at a place called Adams Mission Station, selling sugar and salt flour, rice over the counter, most of the workers with me, all school boys, just left school, cheap labor. Across the valley from the shop was this Adams Mission Station, Adams College. An American by the name of Adam, he started this college for training missionaries in that part of the world. These missionaries, whatever they learned, they came and practiced, practiced it on us in the shop. Or they are they being given training, or they had ready market for it, people on whom they can practice. So they came into the shop to buy the shopping, to buy something, and they said, you know, Muhammad has so many wives. There's something strange. I never thought of anything. I never heard of anything like that. Never heard of it. I know nothing. I know nothing about Islamic history, nothing at all. Shock. He has so many wives. He said, you know, he spread his religion at the point of the sword. If you don't accept Islam, he told the people, you chop off your head, they force Islam down their throat. He copied his book, the Quran from the Jews and the Christians, I know nothing about that. The only thing I knew about Islam, as well as my other fellow workers, was that we read the Kalima. If I met any of you then, as a youngster, and I said, where you come from? He said, come from Egypt. I said, you Muslim? He said, yes. I said, read the Kalima in the Shahada. So you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. That's right, you're a Muslim. You pass. <laughs> what that meant, we didn't know. We don't know what it means. It's a magic formula. If you can read the Shahada, you are Muslim. If you can't, you are not. That's the test. And of course, I prayed the way my father prayed. I made wudu the way he made wudu. I fasted the way he fasted. I know I won't eat the pig. I won't drink alcohol. I won't gamble. These are things I knew. Don't commit adultery. All these things I knew. But what was the real Islam? Nothing about it. All these things they're talking about, so many wives of our Nabi, uh, about the book being copied from the Jews and the Christians, he's forcing his religion down people's throat. I knew nothing about that. And it's an attack, constant attack. It's their pleasure. They're trained to come along and attack, to undermine us. What to do? Leave the job and run away or fight back? But you can't fight back if you have no knowledge. Without knowledge, what can you do? And jobs are hard to get, so you have to stick it out. And Allah is Musabibul Asbab. He had created in me an urge to read. Somehow I just wanted to read anything, everything. From comic art to newspapers, old newspapers, anything that I read is new to me. I read. So one Sunday, being restless, I wasn't reading material. So I go into the boss's warehouse. And 
a pile of newspapers, I started rummaging through that to look for some better reading material than the newspaper, like a magazine. We have magazines like Outstand, Personality. I'm looking for something more readable than the, the newspaper, old newspaper. So while I'm rummaging through, I come across a worm eaten book full of mildew. And I'm reading on top of the book in Latin script, what do you say, English? The word is Harul Haq. I Z H A R U L is Harul S A Q. Haq. It's Harul Haq. So that sounds like Muslim. It's Harul Haq. It's written in Latin script, but it sounds I'm like a Muslim. It's Harul Haq. What is this Harul Haq? So I see at the bottom, in brackets, written, the truth revealed. So I said, maybe, maybe. Is Harul Haq means the truth revealed. That's my conclusion. So let me see what it is all about. So I start reading and it tells me about the British conquest of India, my country. That when the British conquered India, they realized that at any time anybody will give them trouble, it will be the Muslims. Because power, dominion, rule was wrenched out of their hands. They had tasted power, and once you have tasted power, you aspire to get it back once more. The Hindus, there was no fear from that quarter. They were as docile as the cows that they were worshipping. Then, not now. They were very docile. So if they can chain the Muslims, the British felt, if you can convert them, if you can teach them to turn the other cheek, as Jesus preached, that he would strike you in the right cheek, then the other. If you can make them to do that, you can rule India for a thousand years without trouble. So, they started pouring the missionaries into India like frogs in the rainy season. I don't think you have frogs around here. <laughs> no. Too dry, too dry. Like frogs in the rainy season. See? And they started challenging the Muslims to public debate. They felt that if they can make a, mo make a mockery of our learned men in public, say, oh, what you know, the Sheikh, the Salam, your Maulana, he's a fool. Then the, all the people will, you know, uh, and mass become Christian. Make a fool of the Imam, the Sheikh, the Maulana, and the job is done. So they started challenging the Muslims to public debate. The Muslims were reluctant. For one factor, that these were the ruling people. Secondly, they didn't know English. So the Christians started mastering our language. And this is the genius of the Westerner, wherever he is. Wherever he goes, he masters the language of the native. He goes to Indonesia, he learns Indonesian. He goes to Bangladesh, he learns Bangladeshi. When he goes to Zulus, among the Zulus, he learns Zulu. Wherever he goes, he masters the language of the native, which we don't do. We don't do. The Muslim is doing imamat in South Africa. We import the man for 50 years. He won't learn 50 words of Zulu. He won't. Westerner, the Christian, that is a Frenchman, he's a German, he's an Italian, he's a Britisher, he masters your language. So these guys started mastering our language and challenging the Muslims to do it in our own language, in Urdu, the language of the elite. So there was a certain, I'm reading about this fellow, Reverend Founder. He was leading this movement. And he challenged the Muslims to a public debate in Delhi, the capital. In Urdu, come, come now, come. In your language, no excuse now. So, Maulana Abdul Aziz of Delhi, he was constrained to accept the challenge. The younger man, he said, look now, sir, Maulana, he wants to challenge us in our language. What can you say? You mean to say we haven't got a thing? We can't stand up for what is right? So he was forced. And according to what I'm reading there, eh, according to the appointed time and date, the, the debate began. The reverend founder suggesting to the Maulana, you know, Maulana means the learned man, Shah. Suggested to the Maulana, he said, Maulana Sahib, get started. So the Maulana Sahib said, you see, you are our elder brother. Christianity preceded Islam by 600 years. As such, you are our elder brother. And as such, according to our culture, you have the first preference. Secondly, you are our guest. No doubt an unwelcome guest, but the guests are that. So according to our culture, you have the first preference. So the reverend, the Christian missionary, was forced to start the debate. And he started with a question. He said, Maulana Sahib, respected Maulana, 
where is your prophet muhammad now this moment where is he and the maulana thought for a moment and he said he is in jannatul firdaus heavenly bliss with allah bari taala from that answer came the second question he said all right all right now tell us where was he your prophet where was he when his grandson hussein was martyred at karbala make sure he where was he then so the maulana thought again for a moment and he said he was still in jannatul firdaus heavenly bliss with allah bari taala from that answer came the third question he said all right all right now you say that your prophet was with his allah in heaven when his grandson hussein was martyred at karbala so then he asked his allah for help ya bari taala look at my grandchild he's being butchered please rescue him help him then he asked his allah for help and there was a long pause so the, the reverend kun holy speech he started banging his feet so come on come on come on then he asked his allah for help it's a natural thing if you have a big brother by your side and somebody is bullying you won't you ask your brother to help you so come on come on so the maulana said yes he did he did our nabi he did ask allah for help so what did he say because you know he wasn't saved what did he say and there was an inordinate pause a very long pause and the reverend started beating his feet again come on come on what did he say and the people felt his goose was cooked finished maulana said no mara diya humko he was got us cooked up so come on what did he say so the maulana began he said allah cried you know he cried he said what allah cried he said yes, allah cried so i couldn't save my own son jesus how can i save your grandson and it was all over the debate was over see it was a matching of the wit there is a saying that twice armed is he whose cause is just but thrice armed is he who gets in first like the jew every time he gets in first you know he knocks us out he knocks us out twice armed is he whose cause is just but thrice armed is he who gets in first so the maulana knocked him out alhamdulillah I'm reading this in the book. Makes this book interesting for me. I'm sitting there in the in the go down in that warehouse down on the floor, reading there and there. No time to waste. Oh, it's so I'm, I'm so hungry. I see another example okay, about an Arab sheikh. A Christian missionary got stuck into him, and he won't let go. No, they have the Persian ear. If you give them a hearing, they'll never let go. You respect the man, he'll never let you go until you're converted, or you say. get out I'll put a knife through you put back run away and this you do that or you become a christian he'll never let you go so this poor arab chief no chance no hope this christian is coming day in and day out hammering away christ died for your sins god almighty he came down to earth as jesus christ and he sacrificed his life to redeem you from sin and give you salvation you accept it and you be saved you don't have to pray five times a day you don't have to fast you don't have to give zakat you don't have to go to fahad look what you do killing yourself man god is not so hard so unmerciful he is making things easy for you just believe that his son he sacrificed his son his son is himself of course he died for your sin and on and on day in and day out and the other shaykh is trying to find a way out so he thought of an idea he tells his wazir Prime Minister, I said, look, next time this guy comes along, I want you to come and whisper something in my ear. All right, all right. So the guy came as usual. Hmm? Good morning, good morning. Hmm? They come along. The wazir, the prime minister, and whisper something into the and the, the chief's head. And the chief starts to cry. The chef starts to cry like a woman. He's crying as if somebody had died. So the missionary wants to know what's wrong. What's the news? He said, "Don't talk. Too terrible." He said, "Tell me. I can sympathize with you." He said, "No, you can't." So he is trying to persuade the sheikh to reveal the secret. What has happened? So eventually, the sheikh reveals it to the missionary that I just got the news that the archangel Gabriel, Gabriel is alive. He died. So the missionary said, "Don't be a fool." He says, "The angels don't die. Angels don't die." So the sheikh said, "And you fool, you telling me that God died?" Now this is making things in
interesting reading for me. You see, I read. And then I'm reading about the Bible. Say, Look, this was written by some Abdullah Hindi. Some Arab gentleman, he wrote this about a hundred years ago. It was written in Arabic, it was translated into Gujarati, into Urdu, into English, all these languages to help us to give battle to the missionaries. So I'm reading about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that this one contradicts that and that one contradicts the other one. So I don't know all these things. I don't know Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So when I went to Durban, that's about 30 miles away, one day I go to a second-hand bookshop and I buy a five cents, six penny New Testament, second-hand. Oh, so I go back again and I start marking. I start marking. Whatever I read here, it's Matthew, I look for Matthew, mark it. This one contradicts that one, I make references, that one contradicts the other one, mark it. That's how I started. I started marking. Now, I seem to have, I have some knowledge about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So these people come to do the shopping. So I ask them, hey, where are you going on Sunday after church? They say, no, no, I said, where do you live? So they explain this way, that is all right. I'll come and see you Sunday morning. Okay, okay. So now, that's my hobby, my pastime, my occupation. You know, my second, second occupation. It's a, it's a, it gives me pleasure. I go and knock hell into them. Says, for every one point you give me in the favor of your religion, I give you ten against it. That's the only psychology that I know. Hit for hit, not only one hit, I give you ten. You give me one blow, I give you ten. You blame me for that? No, that's how, that's the only thing I knew. I didn't go to any university, I didn't go to college, I didn't go to any Darul Ulum. This is my college, this is my university. Practical experience, go and knock hell into the guy, he's been knocking hell into me and my people, so I go and knock hell into him. And I develop a taste for it. Beautiful. You know, you're coming out on top. And in every field. You know, I have done boxing and I know when you guy get the guy under the jaw and he goes flying. How nice one feels. You don't know. If you have done it, then only you know. I did wrestling and I know when you get the guy in your grip, you know, and he's helpless, you know how you feel, you know, the master of the situation. I have done all these things, you see. I did judo, I did weightlifting, I did wrestling, I did swimming. So so right, this is another type of karate I was doing. It's another karate. So right. So you come, you know, with something and I know how to wait it off and how to knock you out. So when I return to Durban, what do? Now I'm looking for the priest. I had some experience with the training, missionary, now I work for the priest. I go every Saturday afternoon, we close at one, I look for a, after having my lunch, I go and look for a church. I go and meet the father, church father. I say, father, you know, I'm very much interested in religion. I like you to come and share with me your faith. And I want you to come with your family and have dinner with me. I persuade them. Come with your wife and children. And I give them what is called jarda, I don't know whether you know, and some soji and some biryani. Ooh, I feed them. What are like any? I share it with them. And then I share with them the ideas also I have. And knock health into them. And they appreciate. They say, ooh, they love the food and they love my thoughts. But nobody ever comes back. So, this was how I got started into this, and I'm here. But now the Christians, from those good old days, you know, when they were only looking for force, attacking, they have changed the system. They changed. They use other tactics. Now they are studying the Quran, and they confront you with the Quran. There was a young Muslim girl at a place outside Johannesburg called Bosmont, and some Christian missionaries were taking her with the other children for picnic, 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 brainwashing her, and she reached the stage now she wants to become a Christian. So they sent an SOS, they were sold, come Mr. Didad, talk to them. So I went down, and he said, right, bring those people who are responsible, they won't come. First day, I'm lecturing to the Muslims, trying to invite the people responsible for this girl, uh, wanting to become murtad. They're not coming, I lecture, comparative religion, second day, comparative religion, third day, and they're not coming. The last day I was supposed to be there, they turn up, fill up the rose at the back, the missionaries, men and women. At question time, one of the missionaries, he poses a question. He said, you know, your prophet Muhammad, not only that he was an illiterate man, he didn't know how to read or write, but he was also ignorant. Now, to be ummi is not a sin. A person can be unlearned, but he can teach you. If Allah has given him wisdom, 
He can share that wisdom with you. But an ignorant person is going to mislead. This is your prophet. Not only he was an ummi, but he was ignorant. Jahil. So what are you talking about? He said, you see, in your Quran, in Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse 27, it says, فَأَتَدْ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُهُ So at length she brought the day to her people. The story is that Maryam alayhi salam, when she carried the child by a miracle, Allah's kudrat, and the time for childbirth came, she retired to a remote place in the east, and after the birth of the child, she brings this child back to the village. So, that is, the Holy Quran is describing the scene. فَأَتَدْ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُهُ So at length she brought the day to her people, carrying him in her arms. They say, Kalu, they say, Ya Maryam, Lakad Jitti Shayan Fariya. They say, Oh Mary, truly an amazing thing has been brought. They are shocked. Ya Ukta Haruna, O sister of Harun, Ma Kana Abu Kimra Asawin, Wa Ma Kana Ummu Kibariya. They say, Your father was not a man of evil, nor that mother a woman unchaste. In other words, they are insinuating, How is it that you brought this child without a husband? Meaning, implying that he is illegitimate. What is she to do? What can she say? She can say, can she say that I heard some voices, the angels came to me and told me, and I got this child, will they believe? Will they in a mood to believe such a story? Would you believe if your sister told you such a story? So what could she do? She knew that this was no ordinary child. So Allah tells her, for Asharat Ilay, but she pointed to the babe. So they say, Kalu, Taifa Nukalimu Mankana fil Mahdi Sabiya. He said, how can we speak to one with a child in the cradle? And by a miracle he spoke. The Quran testified. فَقَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ The most certainly I am the servant of Allah. آتَانِيَ الْكِتَابِ He has given me revelation. وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيَّا And he has made me a prophet. And on and on. The criticism is, the attack is, he says, your prophet didn't know. He said, يَا أُخْتَ هَارُونَا O sister of Harun, and Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam were brothers, and they were some 3,000 years ago, before, 1,300 before Jesus and Maryam. So your prophet didn't know the difference between Maryam, the mother of Jesus, and Maryam, the sister of Harun. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam had a sister called Maryam. They call her Miriam. In Hebrew is the same. With the Mary, this one they call her Mary, and the other one they call her Miriam. But in Hebrew, this is Miriam, that is Miriam. In Arabic, this is Maryam, that is Maryam. Same. But they try to create a change. Miriam and Mary. So they said, you see, your prophet didn't know that Ukta Harun was 1,300 years before this Maryam. He's confused. Your prophet is confused. So he's ignorant about history, chronology. How can a man like that guide you right? So now if you wait, if you ask our learned man, what is it? What's the story? He says, no, this is a respectful way. You see, Ya Ukta Harun, you come from such a noble ancestry, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam, were what the Jews called the Levites. Levites were the Imamat. They had the Imamat of the Bani Israel in the family. Everything was a family tradition. The Imams of Bani Israel, they are the Levites. And Maryam alayhi salam was a Levite. Harun alayhi salam is a Levite. Musa alayhi salam is a Levite. Imamat of the Bani Israel. Family. Another one does the military, another one does you know, politics, whatever. Different, different tribes are given different, a portion, different types of responsibilities. So, so you see, she comes from a noble ancestry, her father was a good man, the mother is a good woman, now how is it that you have got this child without a husband? But the Christian says, no, no, your prophet didn't know the difference. What can you do? I had to answer this to you, to satisfy them. So I said, you know what? The answer to your problem is in your book, in your Bible. So where? I said, the first book of the New Testament, first book, first chapter, first verse. Can you forget that? Book, the first book of the Bible, the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1. The answer is there. What does it say? He says, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, 
This is the ancestry of Hazrat Isa Alayhi Salam. His ancestors. His father, grandfather, great grandfather, great 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 grandfather, and on and on until Hazrat Adam Alayhi Salam, Hazrat Dawood Alayhi Salam, Hazrat Ibrahim Alayhi Salam, all line, genealogy. So it starts, it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Is that what it reads? It's a yes. He is the son of Abraham, he is the son of David. I say in the Gospel of St. Luke, we are told he is the son of Joseph. He is the son of Abraham, Abraham is the son of David, David is the son of, the son of Joseph, the carpenter. And in the Gospel of St. Mark, we are told he is the son of God. He is the son of Abraham, David, Joseph and God. How many fathers have you got? Four. I said, the guy who's got four fathers, what do you call him in your colloquial language? What do you call him? Hmm? He said, no, no, it doesn't mean that. I said, so what does it mean? He says, the son of Abraham, means Abraham is his father. Son of David, means David is his father. Son of Joseph, means Joseph is his father. Son of God, God is his father. He's got four fathers. A man who's got four fathers, what do you call him in your language? Common street language, what do you call him? Like such a person. So it doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? Say, no, 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 you see, it means he comes from the, 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 the prophet, prophetic tradition of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He comes from the kingly family of Daud alayhi salam. He is the supposed son of Joseph the carpenter, but really he is the son of God. So you have to explain all that, but it doesn't say that. Your book doesn't say that. This is son of Abraham, son of David, son of Joseph, son of God. So you see, now this is what is called Yuzani Jawad in Urdu, you know, an accusative reply. You put the onus upon the other person. But this only comes through experience. I don't know, I haven't read these in books. See, you're working, working, that, that create problems for you, and when they create problems, you know, Allah bari ta'ala from his ilmi ladunni, because you have done some homework before, it clicks, it tickles your memory. Isn't this man? You don't hear voices. Huh? doesn't come anymore. He's retired. If anybody tells you he hears voices, you need a psychiatrist for him. So, this comes through experience. You read, 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 it comes. I happened to visit the Cape province and at a university called Wellington of the Dutch Reformed Church, the people who rule South Africa, they are called the Dutch Reformed Church. They belong to the church. So they invite me to go and deliver a lecture to them. Subject, the original sin. Original sin means the awwal, the first sin. What was that? Adam alayhi salam. He made a slip in the garden and for which, you know, he ate that forbidden fruit and he was kicked out of the garden. That, and because he was kicked out and Mahawa and Adam alayhi salam had the propensity for procreation. So today, at the beginning of 1986, we were 4.8 billion Adams and Eves on earth. 4.8 billion. 4,800 million. Adams and Eve, all of us. So they say that the sin came into the world. We inherited that sin. And as such, that one black spot on the soul of Adam and Eve, Mahawa, now become 4.8 billion black spots on the roof of every individual. And that, that black spot can't be removed by individual effort. So somebody must pay for that. And the one who can pay is God himself. So he came down to earth as a man, he lived up to 33 years of age and he had himself crucified. That is the Christian theology, the original sin. So I explained to the Christians, I said, look, we believe that Adam and Eve made a slip, but Allah bari ta'ala forgave them. And sin is not inherited. Sin is an acquisition. After reaching a certain stage of discretion, you know right and wrong, you are guilty or not guilty, boy or girl. Prior to that, any human child that dies, before re reaching the age of discretion, that child goes to heaven. Whether born in the home of a Hindu, a Christian, a Jew, an atheist, an agnostic, the child goes to heaven. Before the age of discretion, any human child, every human child goes to heaven. Masum, everyone is sinless. So at question time, the missionary priests, all priests, they said, Mr. D. Dad, how can anything good come out of evil? Meaning, adult is an evil, and good, masum, sinlessness, is a good thing. How can a good thing come out of a bad thing? Zina. Huh? 
I know, first he asks. Even if the child is born out of wedlock, yeah, even if the child is born out of wedlock, out of marriage. I said, you see, if there is a law for zina, all right, you punish the man and the woman. According to the Bible, the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. That's what the Bible says. So if there is a law, you implement the law. But you can't find, find the child guilty. You can't strangle the little child because he's well as well zina. He has done no harm. So he said, even if the child was born out of wedlock, both the parties are committing adultery. I said, yes, even if he's born out of wedlock. Both committing adultery. So, out of that, like our friend, you know, was asking of the Maulana in Delhi. He says, how can anything good come out of evil? And now he has a big problem. The problem is to explain that physiologically there is nothing wrong with the child. Psychologically there is nothing wrong with the child. Ethically there is nothing wrong with the child. And now when you explain all this, it takes an hour. At the end of the hour's explanation, the guy can still nod his head. He says, no, Mr. D, Dad, how can anything good come out of evil? He's still there. That's to square one. What to do? And I had a system. The system was, I don't know, I use it uh, quite often, that as soon as I finish my lecture, I sit down. And as soon as a person asks a question, I stand up, I answer. After having answered, I sit down. Next question I hear, I get up and I answer, and I go and sit down. That's the system I have been using. Now, when he said, how can anything good come out of evil? And I had hesitation in getting up. Maybe a few seconds. But I could feel it. He said, look, I'm, now what to say? What am I going to say now? Because this thing is such a huge thing before you. How? Start with physiology. Start with psychology. He starts with morality. Start with what? An hour's lecture? Another hour's lecture? Will they be prepared to listen to another lecture for an hour on this theme? Perhaps they didn't sense it, but I sensed it. And I came to the mic. I didn't have the answer. I didn't have the answer. I didn't know what to say. How to start? And Allah Bari Tala, from his ilmi ladunni, from himself he gives you. You don't hear voices. No Jibreel comes anymore. And I get it. I said, you see, not as it just comes. Because from, I don't know whether... You know, this computer, Allah's computer, it tickles itself somewhere. It says, now look, here it is, you know, your answer is there somewhere. Give it to him, give it to him. So I said, you see, we are talking about the original thing, the fruit, forbidden fruit. So I said, you see, eating an apple in the garden was a great sin. That's what you say. For which God Almighty threw out Adam and Eve. Of course, there's so many other things he did besides. Who oh, Allah bari ta'ala, cursing him and, you know, what and what not made him to do, you know. And now, I'm going to hold us responsible for what he did. Most, you know, nonsensical idea on earth. The most nonsensical idea on earth, that Adam and Eve eat the apple, for me they were kicked out. It's not punishment enough. This God Almighty, to him, is not enough punishment. You kick the man out of the garden, felicity is not enough. Then he curses them, according to the Holy Bible. He says, from now on, you Adam, you must search for your bread. Prior to that, oh, easy living. You know, he wanted great meat, mm, he's there. He wants pasta, <laughs> chop, chicken chop, or what. <laughs> he's got his roast beef, whatever he wants, he gets it. Now, he must say, we are all sweating for our money, I'm sure. We are all sweating for our living. So he says, from now on, man, you must sweat for your bread. And you woman, you must live children in pain and suffering, labor. Still not enough. For this sadistic God that they are talking about, is still not enough. Now he said, each and every one of you must go to hell. 4.8 billion, everybody goes to hell. Because of what Adam and Eve did. Can you imagine? Everybody goes to hell. Unless you believe that this same God Almighty, he came to earth as a man and he died for you. You believe that, you are absolved. That's not everybody goes to hell. I'm asking people, these Christians when they come to me, I'm asking them, you can also ask them. I said, look, tell me now, did Adam ask you before eating the apple? Did he? He says, no. I said, did Eve ask your wife before eating the apple? He says, no. I said, then how can God hold you responsible? Where's your brains, man? What has happened to you? Major Yeats Brown, he wrote a book called The Life of a Bengal Lancer, in which he said, no heathen tribe, no heathen tribe has ever conceived so grotesque an idea involving as it does the assumption 
that man was born with a hereditary stain upon him, and that this stain, for which he was not personally responsible, was to be atoned for. And that the creator of all things had to sacrifice his only begotten son to neutralize this mysterious curse. So no heathen tribe ever conceived such filthy, dirty idea. Most nonsensical idea. Most nonsensical religion on earth. With apologies, my Christian brother, please, don't take offense. Look, I must share with you, I'm telling you now. Analyze it. The most nonsensical religion on earth. Adam and Eve eat the apple, and you go to hell for that. I'm telling people, I say, look, man, imagine you. I'm asking, what's your name? So you tell me. What's your name, Yasha? Hamid. Hamid? Hamid. what? Hamid Ali. Hamid Ali. Oh, Hamid Ali. His name is Hamid Ali. Oh, Hamid Ali. Which Hamid Ali? This is your father. So he describes to me. And your grandfather, oh, he says, my grandfather, you know, he used to be uh, a merchant and he used to travel to Africa and he used to, you know, sell, barter his bait for your... Uh, you, all your uh, wild animals passed. Uh, I said, oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. That is my Your great-grandfather. I remember him, you know, from history. That your great-grandfather killed my great-grandfather. <laughs> I cannot up from the name. So, chatting, chatting, I pull out a knife and put it through him. And the poor man died. So, <laughs> the law apprehends me. So, why did you kill the man? I said, his great-grandfather killed my great-grandfather. You know they can't hang me for that. Do you know that? They'll need a psychiatrist. They say, look, this guy's head is not right. He's mad, poor fellow. He's mad. You can't hang me for that. If I do a thing like that, his great-grandfather kill my great-grandfather, so I kill him. They can't hang me. No country in the world will ever hang me. You know that? They say, this guy needs his head to be examined. He's a loony, loony, lunatic. I said, is God a lunatic? Huh? Adam and Eve eat the apple and he puts everybody into hell for that. Is he a lunatic? He says, no, that's what they're telling me. If I did that, you say, I'm a loony. If God does it, it's wisdom. Does that make his wisdom? He does it. Silly thing like that. Putting 4.8 billion into hell because what Adam and Eve that the apple. The most nonsensical religion on earth. And they're getting converts. And you don't get converts. I want to know why. You don't open your mouth. You don't do the job. That's the reason. If you want to sell something, any rubbish. There's a thing, a fool is born every minute. A fool is born every minute. You can sell any rubbish. You keep on talking, you keep on talking, you can sell. Somebody, somebody will fool enough to buy any rubbish. They're getting converts of Adam and Eve. So he says, I said, you see, eating an apple in the garden was a great sin, according to me, for which Adam and Eve were kicked out. But, in contrast to that, killing the only begotten son of God is the most genius crime you can think of. If eating an apple is such a sin, that Allah kicked out Mahawa and Adam alayhi salam, then killing his only son. In a billion years, he only produced one, and you're going to kill him. In gravity, how huge that sin is. And yet, out of that murder of the only son of God, you say came the gift of redemption, salvation, Rahe Najat, which is a blessing. I said, you tell me, how can anything good come out of evil? You tell me. And it was over. What a nonsensical idea. Can you see? I said, they are studying the Qur'an. I end this talk of fun with this last example. Then, of course, we'll be open to questions. I think. I'm showing you the missionary activities, the Christian. They're not terrified with us. Allah is telling us. He says, وَلَن تَرْضَى أَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ That the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you unless you follow their brand of religion. There's no other hope for you. Either you change them or you get changed. There's no other way. Change them or get changed. And we can afford to lose a million. We are a thousand million Muslims in the world. We can afford. We are carrying too many passengers along with us. Who do nothing and actually they are stumbling blocks to propagation. We can afford to lose a million. Two million. So Allah says, they won't be satisfied with you. And then you follow the brother of religion. So now, they have mastered, they are mastering the Qur'an, they are putting the, throwing the Qur'an at us. And by, they are forcing us to study Qur'an now. They are forcing us. You don't want to study the Qur'an. They are forcing us. In Durban, South Africa, there is the University of Durban Westwood. It is for the Asiatics. 
Indian Christian, Indian Muslim, Indian Hindu, we all go to the one university. University of Durban, Westworld. And our government was so kind and generous to start a department of Arabic studies and Islamic at government expense. But the first man they got as the head of the department was Reverend, sorry, Professor Spencer. He was head. He was a missionary before and he knew Arabic. Supposed to, supposed to be a master of Arabic and he is the head of the department of Islamic studies and Arabic. So while he is teaching Arabic, he is having sly remarks, snide remarks about to the Muslims, you know, about the Prophet, about Islam, about the Quran. You see, the, in Quran, this is not grammatical, this is not right, and this is not right. You know, it should be like this. See, your Prophet being an Indian, he didn't know, you know, that this should be, this is better construction than what he has done here. So the young people come and complain. You see, this professor is talking like this and talking like that. So I said, look, what you do, call him for a cup of tea and call me. I want to talk to him. But somehow it doesn't work. Uh, I don't know what it is. This inferiority complexes our people have. And a couple of years went by and then the Muslim professors came. Dr. Salman Nadwi and Professor Habibul Haq Nadwi to take over the departments of Arabic studies and uh, Islamic. Alhamdulillah. Muslims are taking charge. But the guy is still there, the head. So I'm telling these professors, I said, look man, call this guy for lunch at home and call me, I want to talk to him. It's not working. And the man retired and he went away. After a few years, he returns to Durban. He went to Britain. He lives in Britain. That's his home country. Professor Spencer. He returns to Durban and he comes into the arcade where we have our offices. Islamic Propagation Center. And he goes to an Islamic bookshop where my ex-secretary is. So as soon as he finds out that this is Professor Spencer, he knows that I was yearning to look to meet this fellow. So he said, you know, Mr. Didat is in the office next door. Would you like to meet him? We said, yes. Yeah. He said, come, come. I said, well, this man is also old. So while he's walking, Mr. Vanka, my secretary, he starts the ex-secretary. He rushes. He's got heart trouble, but he rushes. So he comes to me. He says, you know, the enemy. Our oh, enemy is here. You see, his Professor Spencer is here. And he says, he's coming and he knows our language. He says, look, you look out, see what you talk about. Mm -hmm. By the time he has conveyed the message, the guy's in the doorway. I said, good morning, Professor, good morning. Well, come in, come in, sit down. Came and sat down. I said, Professor, what will you have? Something hot or cold? He said, no, cold will be all right. It was a hot day. If you get us two orange juice. No time to waste. If you have a mujahid, there's no time to waste. I said, Professor, before the orange juice can come, I said, Professor, look. I said, you are a professor of Arabic. You know Arabic. And you know Islamic. I want to know how is it that you haven't accepted Islam yet? You know, all this knowledge you have, how is it that you haven't accepted Islam? That's my question. Simple, straight, to the point. Your knowledge of Arabic, your knowledge of the Quran, your knowledge of Islam, I want to know why you haven't accepted Islam yet. So he's asking me, he says, have you got a Quran of Yusuf Ali printed in the Arab country? I said, look, all the Yusuf Ali translations are the same, page for page. There might be a little difference in the production, like this one, and now with the Jewish page and all that, but it's the same. Yusuf Ali, page for page, same. whether it looks this thick or this thick, is the same. He says, no, I want to see one printed in the Arab country. So what's wrong with this? I'm asking him, why haven't you accepted Islam? And he's asking me for a Quran from Arab country. So I had one from Qatar, Doha, Qatar. This is where I'm seated, I took it and I gave it to him. So he opened the Quran. I didn't know where he was opening, but now I know. It was where he just, he opened it. He found verse 39. He read it. And he gives it to me. He said, read. So I read. He reads. Subsequently I learned it. At that time I didn't know the verse. فَقَالَ رَبِّ بِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي لَأُزَّيِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَأُغْوِيَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْمَيْنِ That's the verse. Verse 39. Surah Hijr, chapter 15. So I read that and I read the meaning. It says there. Shaitan is saying, Allah, Ya Barit Allah, Oh my Lord, since you have got me in the wrong, I am going to you know, waylay these people, in fact, and I will take them off the path. 
make things face me. All the wrong things, I'll make them to seem very, very nice to them that they can do and go to hell also. I'm going to waylay them and take them off the track. So I read it. So I said, so what? He said, you see this word, Aghawaitani? I said, yes. He said, you see, this man has translated, you got me in the wrong. Shaitan is telling Allah that, look, you got me in the wrong. About the relationship between Adam and Islam and about eating the food and all that. He said, you got me in the wrong. So now I'm going to take revenge on man. So you got me in the wrong. He said, Aghawaitani doesn't mean that. It means you deceived me. So I said, look, uh, it could mean deceived as well as caught me in the wrong. It's a choice of words. Why can't there be a choice of words, you know, for a Waitani? Like in English, I said the simple English word run, are you and run, has got 90 meanings. 90, 90. 90 meanings. One word, are you and run, 90 meanings. Why can't an Arabic word, a Waitani, have two meanings? I said, no, have you got a dictionary? I said, no, I haven't got a dictionary, Arabic dictionary. No, I haven't got it. Even if I had, I couldn't consult it. I didn't know that amount of Arabic. He says, no, it means what it says. That Allah deceived him. Now, actually, he's answering my question. I didn't know that. I couldn't sense it, that he's answering. So what all this is taking? But I have to cooperate. He's answering my question. Why doesn't he accept Islam? Because Allah is a deceiver. He deceives people. How can I believe in a God who deceives? That he, he's trying to tell me that. But I don't catch the joke. Sometimes I'm a bit slow, you know, in catching up, you see. So I have to copy. I said, look. Then I said, look, this is what Shaitan says. This is what the devil says. And the devil will always talk devilish. You know, I get myself into trouble. Your government has been very kind to me. They gave me a special visa, they gave me VIP treatment, I have come here. But because I know these people will treat me so nice, like a brother. So I bring some, some drug with me, or some alcohol with me, and somehow the custom fellow said, look, I want to see, and he finds it. And I go to jail. You know, when I get back to South Africa, you know what I tell them? I said, this guy, you know, this, uh, uh, this Munim Billah, you know, Abdul Munim, he got me in the trouble. I'm going to blame him. This guy got me into trouble. I won't say, he says, you see, man, I took a chance. I said, you know, some Arab might be interested in this. I might make some easy money. So I took this along. See? I won't say that. I said, yeah, this guy, man, they got me into trouble and put me in jail. Six years, seven years I spent in jail. <laughs> These fellows are no good. <laughs> this is man. This is man. That's what he does. So shaitan does devilish thing. He gets himself into trouble. Now he's blaming Allah. He says, look, you got me in the wrong. If at all, it means that. You deceived me, all right. But if shaitan is saying that, Allah didn't say, I deceived him. I deceived shaitan. He is saying, you deceived me. And we always blame the other fellow when we get into trouble. But I said, you know, in the Bible, God says he deceived. He said, who is? Now he played into my hands. He's asking, who is? in the book of Exodus when God Almighty tells Musa a. Salam, Moses says, go to Pharaoh, Pharaoh and tell him let my people go free my people go and tell him but I will harden his heart Allah says to Hazrat Musa in the Bible that I will harden his heart that he will not let you go he won't let you go. I'll give you the one whack one plague one plague punishment for not letting the people go but who made them to do that? Allah. That I will harden his heart to make him say, no, I want so I can give him punishment. Allah, he did it. Then again he said, I go and tell him, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, second time. Let my people go. But I will harden his heart. So he won't let you go. So I'll give him another back. And he did it nine times. Nine times he hardened the man's heart. Poor Pharaoh, what can he do? If Allah hardens your heart, even Pharaoh, what can he do? So who is guilty? Allah or Firon? Firon is, uh, Allah is guilty. He is hardening the man's heart. Poor fellow. How can he soften it? If Allah hardens it. So I said, you see, in the Bible, God says he deceives. He deceives. So he stood up. I said, Professor, where are you going? Look, I want to arrange a meeting for you in the city hall of the... Professor, Professor, he starts running. And by God, he will never darken that, that, that arcade again. In his life, he will live to a thousand years and he will come back again. 
So this is it. You see, they're mastering the Quran. They're reading the Quran and they're throwing at it. And they create new, new systems now. How to get at the Muslims? He said, find common ground, which is Islamic, Quranic. Allah is telling us to find common ground with him, with the Jews and the Christians. Find common ground. Allah says, pull, tell them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, Ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform and understanding. Then he gives us the terms of getting together. The number one, Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah, wala nushrika bihi shay'an, that we associate no partners with him, wala yastakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaadun min dunillah, and that we do not take from among ourselves laws and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawallaw, faqul ushadu bianna muslimun, but if they turn back, tell them that we are Muslims, we have submitted our wills to the will of Allah. Find common ground with the Jews and the Christians. Now, they are not there. So they are doing it to honor us. They come into our home. This is a new experience now. They knock at our door. They meet our children. They talk to them. They say, you know, Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. He's getting your response. He said, of course, we believe that. Don't we? Yes. He says, you know, he was the Messiah, Masih. He was the Messiah, Masih. Masihullah, Allah's Messiah. He said, yes, yes, we believe that. He said, was Muhammad Masihullah? He said, no, he was Rasulullah. But you see, Isa is also Rasulullah and Masihullah, both in the Quran. Your prophet is only Masihullah. I mean, Rasulullah. It seems to be that, you know, maybe he has got one less qualification. That's what he said. He says, you see, Jesus was born miraculously, without any million intention. No, 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 we believe that. Was Muhammad so born? He says, no. He's got another point in his favor. See, this case is going heavier inside of Jesus. He says, you know, Jesus, he gave life to the dead. He says, yeah, yeah, by God's permission. Bismillah. He says, yeah, yeah, did Muhammad give life to the dead by God's permission? He says, no, that I know. Another point in his favor. He is going still down, heavier. He says, you know, where is Jesus? He is in heaven. He is coming back? He says, yes. Where is your prophet Muhammad? He says, he is buried in Medina. So perhaps his bones have rotted in the grave. So no, 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 we believe he's Hayatun Nabi, the living prophet. Yeah, metaphysically. But maybe physically his bones have rotted in the grave. But maybe. So don't you think God had a purpose in doing all this? Does it for nothing? When you make Kurbani, Bakri, do you call it, you know? Remembering sacrifice of Abraham. You look for a perfect animal without blemish, not, by, not blind, you're not broken. You're not cut, not limping. Perfect, right, right. See, if God Almighty wants to make a sacrifice, will you look for second best? Meaning your prophet, second best? Argue with Go, Go ahead. So, there are ways and means, my dear brethren. You see, in this field, now, if you get these booklets of mine, they answer these things. So easy. It's so easy and so pleasant. All these things are not worth anything, Allah. You can, you know, pick his bubble, this balloon of his, every one of them, and burst them up. Doesn't all these things that they're talking about. But you have to be a little bit of study and you have to do a little bit of homework and you have to start sharing with people. And this is our trouble. The Muslims of the world, they are not doing anything. They don't want to do anything. They sit on the backside, leg upon leg, passing time. I don't know what, what you people don't smoke so much hookah anymore. But there are other pastimes. You're not doing the job. My brothers and my sisters, Mr. Chairman, I urge upon my Muslim brothers and sisters that you do a little bit of homework. Learn to share our deen with the Jews and the Christians. There is a destiny in store for us all. They were prepared to receive our message. Allah Barit Allah prepared them. He sent prophets after prophets to them, preparing them for to receive this message. But we haven't delivered that message to them. The very first people who are to receive this message are they. When Allah Barit Allah confers upon us that honor of being the khayr kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnaas, so you are the best of people evolved for mankind. فَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْحَوْنَا مِنْ مُنْكَرْ Because you enjoy what is right and you forbid what is wrong. وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ and you do Allah. Half a word. That's only half a word. The complete word. وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَتَانَ خَيْرَ لَهُمْ But if the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, if they hearken into this message, it will be better for them, and it will be better for you. مِنْهُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Among them there are good people. 
Mu'min, faithful people, wa aksaruhumul fasikun. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. Two types. Among the Jews and the Christians, there are two types of people. Good people and perverted transgressors. But we must find ways and means of getting at them both. You come to go into college, this guy is no good. Find ways and means of giving battle to the good guy, how to approach him, and how to give battle to the perverted transgressor. Wa aksaruhul dawan and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. وفي ختام هذه المحاضره دعونا الى ان نشكر الداعيه الاسلامي فضيله الشيخ احمد ايداد هذا المتحدث في لغه الكريم الكريم كما نقول والمستمتع بحديث الاسلام ودراسه فضائله وقيمه اكثر من متعه المشاهدين بافلام الفيديو والفهم ونسال الله ان نكون جميعا مسائل اعلام لا تنقل الا الصالح وتتعطل مجرد ما انت بها الجدار الصالح نشكركم على حسن استماعكم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته